And it's good business that allows good architecture, not the other way around. Business of Architecture, episode 360. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with Ray Brown, who is a business coach and entrepreneur who has worked in the UK, South Africa and the US. Now, Ray operated at CEO level for about 25 years across six companies, including overseeing the sale of Scotland's largest water cooler business, Premier Water, to global food giant Danone in 2005. He then relocated to beautiful Australia with his family in late 2005 and was selected to join the Australian arm of Sherlaw's Group, an international business coaching organization. Um, As a business coach of a number of different architectural practices based in Melbourne, Ray recognized that there's a significant gap in the education provided to architects around running a business and Obviously, as we know, there's a lot of limited literature and resources available to support them in this role. So Ray became and co-founded Archibiz, which is designed to help ambitious architects build profitable and sustainable businesses whilst doing great design. And Ray's passion is helping business owners to realize their personal potential and that of their organization. So Ray and I had a really fantastic conversation and we discussed lots of the constraints and obstacles that many architects and business owners find and face whilst running their business and the things they can do to move around them. So sit back, relax and enjoy Ray Brown. Ray, welcome to the Business of Architecture. An absolute pleasure to be speaking with you. You're all the way in not so sunny Melbourne today. Not so sunny today. We, we, um, Melbourne's renowned for its changeable weather, and we're experiencing that in spades at the moment. And originally, you are from the UK. You're from Scotland. I, I am. I, uh, I still have my accent, and uh, I tell people in Australia that I didn't have an accent until I came here. <laughs> Seems to tell me that I've got a strong accent. Accent. Uh, <laughs> very, very, very pleased to hear that you've retained your uh, your heritage like that, and and you're a, you're a business consultant, and, and you you specialise in working with architects, helping architects uh, grow and develop their own client client acquisition strategies and strengthen their businesses. Um, and you've you know you've got a past uh, you know your your career as well. You've been an entrepreneur and um, a business person and a CEO in in many different fields. So, so let's just start by um, talking about how did you how did you discover this route? How did you, what's, what's your history, if you like? Um, well, I've always been interested in, in business. I started my career in South Africa with a multinational. Hmm. And then I started my business um, too many years ago than I'm here to admit. Uh, started carpet retailing, carpet cleaning, had an office cleaning company for 10 years. Uh, and then I ran two big food businesses as a CEO uh, one making sandwiches and one selling carrots to the UK supermarkets. Um, in the early 2000s, I, with a colleague, we, we built a water cooler business. Mm. Uh, and I was the guy in two, 1999, I said to my business partner, there's no money in water. Who's going to buy Scottish water when it's perfectly good out of the tap? <laughs> um, but we, <laughs> uh, and we, we built a really successful a water cooler business that we sold in 2004 to uh, Danone, the food company. Right. Uh, and that, that funded my uh, move. I'd always wanted to go. I mean, lived in South Africa and had got a taste for the sun. Mm. And I thought when my children are a little bit older, uh, we'll go somewhere warm. And here we are in Melbourne. So that was 2005. And uh, I, I became a business coach. I actually started a sailing business in Melbourne. Uh, and at the same time, I ran a business coaching company, uh, joined a coaching company who taught me the ropes, if you like. Mm. Uh, and then I've gradually over the years specialized in uh, architects and particularly the leaders of architectural practices. Uh, it's really interesting. It's you, you mentioned there that you've, you know, you've sold a business which is a really kind of a, a unique experience in many ways for lots of business owners and often a kind of uh, a sort of dream scenario. And it's a really interesting 
process to do because many architects we don't often think about an exit strategy we don't think about selling a business particularly um so what what were the kind of things that you learned in that process that help you with architects um i think there are a number of key things in, in running a business that that sort of get you through to what i would call advanced growth mm. and, and one of them succession and I think uh, succession is often spoken about in terms of exit only but there really needs to be a succession philosophy through throughout a business mm. for the, the staff that work in the business and for the owners of the business uh, and I think the key is uh, there's a connection here to vision personal and, and business vision why are you in business do you want something that's going to be handed on to your children or do you want your next level of managers to take over or do you want to sell the business to a third party uh, and I think the key is to start early with that process of thought uh, so that um, you're doing a sales job effectively so yeah. prepare the business for an, an eventual outcome that, that you can try and predict. Mm. Uh, selling a business is not easy it's um, you, you need to find a willing purchaser and you need to have a business that's robust enough uh, particularly if, if architects tend to be um, personality focused in a lot of cases and that if you're going to be selling a business is, a, is probably a big mistake. And what are the sort of the, the key things in making a robust business? A for your, your experience in selling a business and also how can architects start to think like that or what, what are the sort of yeah, I think there are three elements to business, uh, finance and admin, operation, sales and marketing. Mm. And we need a robust, whether you're an architect or any other business, you need a, a robust set of systems and processes and thinking around all three parts of the business. Uh, then you need to make the business profitable. Then you need to make it sustainable so that it's not overly dependent on one or two people within the business. Um, because Typically, they're the ones that want to leave the business. And if you don't want to be locked into that business after you sell, uh, then you need to make the business uh, sustainable with it. Right. And how, how does that happen? How do you go about making a business that can operate with, without you being involved? Well, delegation is, is and, um, pushing... Architects, like lots of other technicians, are very keen on control. Uh, and that often looks like I need my hand on everything. I need to check things. I need to review drafts. And if, if you want to build a, a robust business, you need to have the confidence to pass on work, to share the load, uh, mm. and particularly to make sure that work is being done at the right level in the business. Uh, that's a, an issue I come across in lots of businesses that... Um, People went to, I had one lawyer, senior partner, still opened the mail. And because uh, that was his idea of keeping control and keeping an, an eye on things. But it's, it's short sighted. And um, you, need, you need to have the trust in people and you need to be comfortable with, with a few surprises in business. Mm. People, funnily enough, do things differently. That's the first thing. And they also tend to make mistakes now and again. So, You've got to get comfortable with both of those as you delegate work and spread things out through the business. And and what was it that brought you or led you to working with architects specifically? Um, well, I was interested in really initially it was to be CEOs. I, I like working with particularly young CEOs who are running businesses because they, they typically take that role with no training, no exposure at that mm. level of business. Um, and we wanted some an online presence, and CEOs was just too wide a niche. So we did a lot of uh, learning and um, study ourselves about online, and the, the recurring message was narrow the niche. Get, get a niche that uh, you can establish the problems, you can build a profile within that niche. Uh, and I was already working with five architectural practices. They were all successful, profitable, um, and I'd learned a lot about architectural development of architectural practices so it made sense to make that the niche and and even within that niche it's the uh, startup five-year-old business with maybe five to ten staff 
that is my, my ideal client. Right. And and those kinds of practices, the five to ten staff, they've been going for a, a, a few years. What are the kind of common pains or problems or experiences that you see coming up again and again? Uh, well, I've just written an article today on um, the five big mistakes that uh, architecture has made. Uh, and, you know, I think um, top of my list is somewhere along the line, architects have been told that they're different. And that, um, <laughs> architectural, architectural businesses are completely different from other businesses. I, I enjoyed your podcast with uh, was it Lennart the other the other week and uh, he was saying that his business had applied architectural practices to business rather than the other way around mm. and I found myself kind of almost shouting at the the, the receiver because um, I, I, I just don't think that's a good position to take and it's not a good message for uh, evolving architectural practices to hear. Mm. Business is simple um, and the, the top of the list for me is realize that you're in business and, it, and it's good business that allows good architecture, not the other way around. Um, and I think that that's re really important. The second thing is a uh, lack of vision. So it's really interesting that, that architects would spend their days uh, designing buildings that don't yet exist. But when I say to them, could you, could you show me the drawings for your business? They, they kind of give me a blank look. Uh, what do you mean drawings for the business? Well, what are you trying to create here? What does it look like in two years or five years' time? Yeah. Um, and a, any business without a vision is, um, you know, you're missing a big piece of the story. You're missing yeah. that, that, that energizing view of the future that gets you over the humps and, and uh, allows you to make choices that, otherwise would be really, really difficult. Um, a third thing would be uh, financials. Uh, business, business is about the numbers a lot of the time, and, and financials are uh, really important and also really simple. But if you haven't been taught the basics, you don't know how to read a balance sheet or a profit and loss account, you don't know what uh, KPIs actually are, and cash flow is, is probably a bit of a mystery too. So. Mm. Getting financials right, that, that's really important for architectural practices. And, 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 and it's interesting that you say that, um, you know, a lot of the time architects, we, we, you know, I hear a lot in the industry that architecture is a unique kind of business um, because there are, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting recently, I mean, I often say that, you know, the, the, the US, the business round table in the US, you know, kind of recently, all these uh, kind of large corporations from Apple to Amazon to Boeing, um, you know, redefined what the purpose of a business was to include the fact that they have an impact and a responsibility to stakeholders who are not just the shareholders of these companies. And this is something that's kind of in the code of conduct of being an architect is that we have a, a responsibility to uh, the the wider context and the other people that don't use our our our, our buildings, if you like, and 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 that for many architects, I know that that becomes quite a a, a sort of a, a thing that we end up holding on to as being like this. This is something that does make us very very unique as a, as a business. But where can that get in the way, do you think, of, of actual running a business? I uh, think it's really detrimental. I think it, and to some, some degree, it, to me, it almost comes across as disrespectful to other professions. Mm. I meet lots of passionate people, whether they be lawyers, doctors, plumbers, electricians. They take a pride in their work. They know they make an impact. Yeah. Um, a lot of the stuff that they do is... is um, long-lasting and, and impactful for clients uh, and for our architects to say well we're different because we make a bigger impact or whatever the story is that goes with that um, it, architects use that as an excuse to be different and, and I think that that is um, well what we don't need to learn about business because we're architects I think um, that's if, if it was working for architects and architects were being paid what they were worth, uh, and they had a steady flow of um, business coming in, mm. uh, and 
think that I think the statistic in the UK is only five percent of buildings are architecturally designed. Uh, now, if that would say to me that there's something wrong with the business model, um, mm. and I don't, and I don't think. Um, again, you, you in your survey you, you said that low fees were one of the forty-three percent of people said that was the biggest issue. Yes. Um, and, and one of the comments that you had in, in the LinkedIn flow was uh, really blaming the competition uh, by miscalling architects and blaming the clients for not understanding the process. Well, I think look in the mirror. Don't, don't blame the competition and the clients. Uh, I think architects need to really educate clients better yeah. and they need to be able to sell their value better. Um, yes. So that people will put their hands in their pocket and part with the hard-earned money uh, for something that they understand and value. And and what do you think, what do you see the common sort of mistakes are in the way that architects go about trying to sh- uh, sell or communicate value? And this is something that, you know, I again, I, I, I see it a lot that we're very quick as a profession to blame either the overarching institutions, you know, the ARB or the REBA, like it's their fault they should have some sort of, you know, conditions or you know to blame or to become to have an adversarial relationship with your developer clients and to see your developer clients as only being money hungry is a really unhealthy way to look at the people that are you know that we're trying to to work with and this phrase of like we need to be able to communicate our value uh, better often I think gets misinterpreted it misinterpreted as being like we need to communicate what's important to us and they need to un- they need to understand it. Correct, correct. I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, I, I did a webinar recently on the, on the I think it was the five pillars of, of value, uh, and and the starting point for that was to realise that clients are different, and you know, architects tend to treat all clients the same. We're all people, and they need to be communicated in the same way. That, that's a mistake. Clients. The business coaching company I was in had a very simple model, think, feel, and know. So thinking people look for data, feeling people look for emotions and color and story, um, and knowers just want to cut to the chase. So the starting point is to realize who you're dealing with as a client and give them the message in a way that makes sense to them. Um, and then if you come below that, uh, the, the value proposition can be broken down in a whole lot of different ways. Uh, for instance, the, the, amount of, the amount of hours that goes into an architectural pro- project, I had no idea. Um, architects say, I'm going to charge you 12% of the build cost, and it's going to be $150,000 or whatever the number is, and that should be enough for you. You know what an architect does. Um, be prepared to pay me that money. Well, I just don't think that's uh, enough. So hours would be the first one. We're just hours in the wider sense. Well, what are you going to do for me? in terms of the work. And a thinking person would be really attracted by that conversation. They would want to know the, the nuts and bolts of the process. Mm. Uh, second, second thing is knowledge and experience. How do you differentiate your knowledge and experience uh, without doing it in the way most architects do, which is fill their website with pictures of buildings? Um, and you know, here's another building that we've done and we've designed. and. I think this looks very close to the one that you want. And that, that's a very narrow, narrow approach. Uh, so ours first, knowledge and experience second, um, systems and processes. How, how do you do the system and process of architecture? And is it different from the guy down the road or the other three architects that you happen to be speaking to? Mm. Getting that story right as a differentiator is really important. Uh, the outcomes of the built the buildings themselves, the, what you've done in the past, that needs to be presented in a particular way uh, that suits your business best. Uh, and the last one that I kind of added, the fifth leg, if you like, after I spoke to one of my clients and he said, we've just won a kind of half a million dollar fee job and we were the second most expensive out of seven that were tendering. Uh, and I got it because I got on well with Guy, the developer. He really liked me. I liked him. Um, so personal chemistry is a big part. Yes. How do you build a relationship and capitalize on that personal chemistry with the, the prospect? 
and not underestimating that can cut through a lot of the other stuff and it's interesting as well because it's it can be quite a big blind spot if you like for for many um, architects working that you know this kind of we've always done it this way we're always going to communicate in this particular way it's really important for the client to understand this is how we work this is what we do um and it kind of becomes the same the same same thing how can how can an architect or how do you work with clients to help them or well, i suppose if they're already coming to you they're kind of they're, they're they're aware that there might be a blind spot how do you help architects kind of recognize those blind spots or what are the sorts of first things that you can practically put in place to start communicating value in a in a, in a way that means something to the client yeah all right so i i tell my clients that they need to be a little bit like a stand-up comedian um, they need to have prepared spontaneity. Everything needs to sound uh, as if you've just thought of it and as if it's just um, a, an idea that you've had there and then for that particular client. But, but you need a stock of these things and you need a framework to frame up the conversation that you have with the prospect. Mm. Uh, and I, I actually call it the sandwich story that you need. Um, and, the, and the meat in the sandwich is the, is the offering. Okay, so you're an architect, you get planning permission, you design buildings, you, there'll be 10 things that you put on. And that, people normally focus on their offering when they're telling the story. Um, but other architects will have the same offering. So mm -hmm. that's not enough to differentiate your business. So one side of the, the sandwich is um, the client issues that you resolve. How do you address problems better than other people? Uh, and, and that typically sounds like uh, people come to us when um, this particular problem or that particular problem or last year we had a client who and then you tell a story that, that's very similar to the situation you presented with the, the prospect um, case studies stories are really important in communication and, and when online people are saying we've got to be better at storytelling and the reason for that is that We've been telling stories for millions of years or thousands of years. Yeah. Uh, we've been doing the technology, reading, writing stuff relatively recently. So, so people resonate with, um, with stories. Uh, so that's one side of the sandwich. Offering in the middle is the meat. And the other side is what I've called differentiators. What are the things in your business that make you different? And how do you, how do you tell that story? Mm. Uh, maybe around a particular piece of process, it may be a particular focus that you've got. We, we specialize in age care or we specialize in um, young professionals uh, who are looking to build a, a home. Uh, and and it's, it's important to, I, I find that, that architects, uh, they're comfortable being the same as their peers. They like yeah. peer recognition. Um, I had a dinner last night for my clients online and offline and we filled a restaurant and there's never any shortage of conversation when you put architects together. They, uh, they know how to speak and they, they enjoy trading stories. And, but, but there is an element of groupthink can creep in. Um, and this is just the way the world is and aren't we hard done by? Well, well, well this, this is really interesting and very refreshing and powerful to hear. And I, I'm, I'm always very uh, keen to to have these outside perspectives on the industry because you know we are very good at speaking internally as a group of professionals and we love it and we enjoy it and um you know there's a there's a kind of you know there's a reverence to it and it's kind of partly to do with the long period of education and you know in in many ways there's the there is a culture of architects you know, and I've had this as a, a sort of belief in my own head and I've had to reconcile it and I've seen the damage that it's done when I've tried to run a business where, you know, I've been more interested. It sounds crazy to say it, um, but I've been more interested in what other architects think of the work or the projects. That's been, the, that's been an emotional kind of guider, if you like, um, and always been interested in you know what's what the what what are the other architects doing what are they going to look like oh, i can't engage with that because you know that's going to let go how from your perspective how do you bring awareness to architects you know what you're, you're doing that um 
It's a great question. It, a lot of it, I use humour a lot, to tell you the truth. I uh, try and expose things and, and use analogies. And um, I, I actually speak about, I used to do the presentation and say business is a bit like a chess game. Mm. And you need to learn the rules because if you don't know the rules, it, it's meaningless. And one of my clients said, uh, no, it's not that complicated. It's actually more like checkers or drafts, <laughs> really simple game. Um, and I've, I've actually changed it again. And I now say that um, business is a bit like snakes and ladders. Mm. Uh, I, I, can, I taught my six-year-old grandson in about 10 minutes to play snakes and ladders. And he really enjoys it. And he was into the game and he, he always wants to play. And had I presented that board to him with the squares and the ladders and the snakes, without the explanation, he would have got bored, disinterested, meaningless um, activity. And for me, that's, a, that's the way architects tend to be a little bit around business. Right, yeah. Um, it's not something I'm interested in. It's not something I want to learn about, and it, I, it feels complicated. So I'll just leave that at the side. But when I can show my, my class in the office finance, sales and marketing at a really simple uh, level, mm. they quickly become engaged. Um, and it, once they start seeing results and they're being paid a proper salary and the business is making a profit, yeah. then life becomes, you know, this business thing is not quite such a boogeyman as I thought. Yes. Yeah. And it's not as, it's not as scary and it's not as, it's not as evil and kind of something to be avoided as, as you know, we often are kind of led to believe. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's very deeply rooted in the architectural profession, and I think there are a lot of people that look a bit like me, um, you know, slightly older, or a lot older, uh, and they have a philosophy around. Um, in fact, I can tell you a story. I was on a panel at a conference here in Melbourne, and an architect, senior architect, in a big practice, uh, who should be probably nameless, but he took the microphone at one point and he said, what you people have got to remember, and the audience was full of 200 small architectural, he said, what you people have got to remember is that we are not a business. No, we're not an industry, we're not a business, we are a profession. And, and I thought, what a terrible thing to say to people, because what does that actually mean? If you're going to continue starving, if you're going to continue um, struggling, you know, that's that's completely the wrong advice. I think uh, be good at architecture, but be good at business as well, and enjoy both. Mm. Yeah. Where do you think this this culture comes from, from your perspective? And, and is and is it important to know where the root comes from, or is it more important just to be able to to recognise it and actually start, un, you know, taking the responsibility that we're running a business, and there are certain thing there are certain things that we need to we need to like you know. If you want to, if you want to live like a, a starving artist, that's a choice, but it's not the only. It's not the only way. Yeah, I, I don't think it really matters where it comes from. I think um, I mean, we've all read about. I was astounded when I saw the first time that archi uh, architects were, by their own association, uh, prohibited from advertising for, for a long time. Yeah, and, and that that is a fact. You kind of go, where, where would that come from? Because that that is classifying architecture as, as being different. But we, we are where we are. I think the other thing is that the long training period, um, if, you, if you added business in on top of that, you'd be there for 10 years probably rather than seven years. Yeah. So uh, I, I think the, the root cause is, is almost irrelevant. Yeah. I think it's where do we go from here? Because I don't, I don't think architecture as a profession is particularly healthy. I think yeah. uh, the, the other prof professions have been nibbling around the edges and taking parts of the business. And um, I think architects are um, in a very defensive, protective mode. I protect what I've got. Uh, and I don't think that's particularly attractive to the market. I think um, people, in a lot of cases, buy confidence. They buy expertise, confidence, and and. Uh, someone is strong enough to use their expertise in my best interest. Mm. Um, I, I did um, a, a seminar with, uh, I'm just trying to remember the lady's name. She wrote a book in the UK, uh, The Value of Architecture. 
uh, I think she's from Sheffield Uni, and she was speaking, she's got a chapter in her book uh, called uh, Post-Occupancy Reviews. Right. And uh, I thought, what the hell is a post-occupancy review? That's an interesting concept. And when it comes down to it, it's asking your customers how <laughs> they performed. And you know, to think that that's a novel, um, you know, big idea and uh, maybe we should be doing it, it's, it's, it's almost laughable. Yeah. Um, and, and I have a, a colleague in Melbourne who actually set up a post-occupancy review program for a big architectural practice. And they stopped it after three months because they were getting bad feedback. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, it, it, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's actually very refreshing to hear your straightness on the topic uh, on this and, and very, you know, um, yes, it kind of, there's, an, there's it's, you know, it's music to my ears in many ways to to hear the hear the the clarity with which you're speaking and you know the kind of the the urgency actually of what needs to be done in the industry and to be hearing it from you know from a from a, from a business professional and expert of you know a lot of experience and expertise like yourself that you know you, you don't think the industry is in a healthy way at the moment um and it's something to really kind of for us as architects to to wake up to and be very proactive in terms of you know learning learning to take responsibility that we're running businesses here and in in order to be able to fulfill on those important design agendas and sustainability and all this other kind of stuff that the, the the business hygiene has to be locked down and put into place yeah the the good news and here's the selfish piece I think it's great. For me as a business coach, um, I think it's fabulous. Because, uh, it's my job to create the architectural profession. It's my job to help my clients become stronger. And, and yes. if they're operating in a market where most of the market is what I would call uh, commercially immature, then it's quite easy to differentiate yourself. It's, uh, if you take Melbourne, there's thousands of architects. Yeah. Very few people are closing their doors. So that means there's a lot of work out there. And the, the small portion of guys who get their act together, uh, it's, it's quite easy to differentiate and to make money and to pull in the business because uh, the competition is, um, in business terms, so weak. Yes, yeah. And so, and so how, do you, how do you work with a client then? Do you work one-on-one -on -one or do you work in, in larger groups? What's the sort of the, the process that you the boot camp or the process that you put? Well, well we, we, I have to split into two. The, the work that I've done with architects face-to-face, um, -face, uh, that typically involves a business review initially, look at the business, same as any other business, find out the, the strengths and weaknesses. I think a key um, part of my uh, offering and suggestion, if you like, is the first thing I do is set up a board. So every business needs a board that, where the strategic conversation takes place. The forward strategy is discussed, vision, and we have a, a, a monthly meeting. I typically I think I chair five or six architectural boards. Uh, and we have actions and improvement projects and those things, all focused on that one meeting during the month. Yeah. I sometimes do one-on-one -on -one coaching with the individuals just to help them personally develop and I help them with any specific projects that they're running uh, during the month. The, the online uh, business is a little bit more uh, structured. So we have an eight week, what we call um, designing architectural practice success. Uh, and that's something we've been developing over the last year. Uh, it's an eight week program done via Zoom with a maximum of 10 people. Uh, and they meet weekly, we go through a, a structured program that just introduces the fundamentals of business. Business is not difficult, mm. but if, if you've never been taught, it, it's a bit of a mystery. So in the course of that eight weeks, we video them all so they can watch them afterwards. There's a 60 page, page workbook that goes with it. Uh, and we find that, that the feedback from that has been amazing. Uh, and a few of the clients have engaged us subsequent to the course 
to really help them implement implement some of the suggestions and, and uh, plans that we've, we've given them. So and the, the uh, how how have your clients found the impact of good business fundamentals has an impact on their design work? Uh, I think most of these folks are good designers anyway. I don't, yeah. I don't think that being a better business person is going to make you a better designer. I think the the, the designing part is, is really the ticket to the game. I think um, if you're a bad architect and you do bad designs, you're not going to succeed. Yeah. You need the, the fundamentals of um, a, a product that, that delivers what the client expects, a service that, that meets the client expectations around delivery and price and all those things. So I, I can't have much impact. In fact, I don't take much interest in the architectural product yes. because that, that's my client's job. Not, yep. uh, I, I work at board level and strategic level in the business. Uh, and I think um, it, it, it would affect the, the quality of the design. I, in, I, I, I suppose what I meant by that was was the was making the link that you know having good business fundamentals in place means that you have the access to winning better projects. Therefore, you have your you have the ability then to be able to put more resource onto a project, which means that that you can you can now design in a better way. You can actually you've got more um, ability to do your job properly because you've got those things in in place. And, and yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's right. I think you've got time to think. I think the the, the leaders and owners of architectural mm. practices they very easily get sucked into treadmill working and long hours and working at weekends and um, and that becomes a norm. And, and trying to break out of that is, is really hard. So uh, you need to build a business that that's um, functional to the the point where work is being done by the most appropriate resource. And, and that, that's one of the biggest issues in, in all businesses, not just architecture. Yeah. That the, the, um, the owner of the business does the books at night because he can't afford a $30 an hour uh, bookkeeper. But if, if you think of yourself as a $200 an hour resource and that you should be doing $200 an hour work, you're actually costing the business 170, not saving 30. Um, and that, that a lot of the stuff that we do with architects is, is about mindset changing. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of entrenched mindsets uh, in all sorts of business, not just in architecture. And, and if you can break through that and um, really, again, we, we come back, back to vision. What are you trying to create? And what's the upside potential in this business that you've got? Do you want to do you want to be in the same position in a year's time that you are now? Mm. If not, let's envisage what a year's time could look like, and then make the investment that we need to start that process. Could you could you tell us a little bit more about some of your insights into the mindset of you know what what a successful mindset kind of looks like? I know that's a kind of a big broad thing, and what are kind of what are some of the sort of unhealthy mindsets that you kind of commonly come across in architects? Um, well, the, the biggest one and the one that I've been working on in the last year or so is the, the technician mindset right? and the, and the leader mindset. Uh, so the, the, the architect is like the lawyers and accountants, they, they are at heart technicians. Okay? And um, the, the, the top line differentiator is Technicians live in the world of uh, answers. So you come to me with a question, I'll give you the answer. That I get paid for providing uh, answers to you, uh, whereas the leader typically lives in the world of questions. Uh, so you posted something tonight about listening. Um, but good quality questions typically become before good quality listening. So um, if you listen to a technician, they, very, they live in a world they make statements and provide answers, not asking good quality questions. Mm. So that, that, that mindset, um, I think it's really at the, the top of my list. Um, second would probably be a mindset of control. If, if you're a technician, you want to control things and 
be very clear on how processes and things work. Whereas if you're going to be a leader, you need to be a little bit more vulnerable, uh, expose, exposure to vulnerability, live a little bit in the grey rather than black and white. Yeah. Um, so that that really, those kind of mindsets are, are important. Uh, th- there are some specific ones in um, in architecture. Uh, architects don't make a lot of money. That's rubbish. Archit- I know architects make yeah, quite a bit of money. It, architect, architecture is different. We've spoken about that already. Architecture is no different. Um, sales is a sleazy activity. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, sales is an essential business, so that's our mindset. Well, it, that, that's interesting as well. The 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 kind of acceptance and the belief that you know, well, I'm an architect. We don't do that. We don't do. We don't work for money. We do it for the love of the of the of designing. And you know, you, you don't make money as an architect anyway. So we we'll just accept it. That's just part and pass. That that I see that so often that there's almost a kind of just accepted belief that. You know, that's just the way it is. We we, you know, that's not. You know, we we can't make money. The industry doesn't operate like that. And I think it, it's so destructive. Yeah, but but it can change. You can. Change. I've got one client. We were speaking about it just this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, uh, this guy, when I joined, started working with the business. They were at six hundred thousand a year, and they had three partners and three staff. So there wasn't there wasn't a lot of money left over. They were the classic starving architects working really hard. Yeah. Uh, and the particular individual was the mousy one of the three, sat in the corner, didn't say very much. And in the course of the last four years, they have uh, they got rid of one partner, so they're left with two. And they've been through a difficult exit process with it, that partner. Mm. Uh, but the business has come out the end, and this, the individual I'm speaking about, I had coffee with him on Thursday, and he told me that between the 15th of December and last Thursday, he personally had signed a million dollars worth of fees wow. uh, for the practice. Um, and the, and the, the scary thing was how we're going to get people to do the work and how we're going to get it out. Uh, but, but he was quite confident about that. He wasn't fearful. He was just, it was a, a business issue that he now has to resolve. But that, that's how big a change you can get. Mm. And, and that's a business that's um, all the, all the, principals and owners get paid above market rate. Why, why would you work for your own firm being paid less than you would with less hassle and less accountability working for the guy down the road? I, I remember you when we first spoke, actually, you said to me, you know, that that's such a kind of common thing that you see that architects, again, you know, we accept it that, you know, you, you, you leave a, a, a better paid job to start your own business to be having more risk more stress, less time, and way less money. Like, that's not the purpose of a business. Absolutely. And, and that's, a, that's a, what would you say? It's just an unhelpful story that, that has crept into architecture mm. that is made okay by some of these older guys who say, well, that's just the way it is. You know, and, and who are you to tell us there's a better way? Yeah. Well, I'm here to tell you there's a better way because I see it in my clients. Mm. I can see the work that they're doing, the awards that they win, and I see the the profit line in the uh, profit loss at the end of the year, and the nice cars. Those same two guys board meeting this afternoon. They're speaking about we need to upgrade our cars, <laughs> and and they're doing that because they can afford it and they want to look successful and they want to show up. But the, the guy this afternoon said, "I need to change my car because uh, last week I went to see a." Uh, Chinese client, he bought a house for $10 million and he wanted to do a $4 million renovation. Uh, and I left my car in the two streets away because I didn't want him to see my car. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Brilliant. Well, Ray, I just want to say a massive thank you for your time uh, today. And also just thank you for the work that you're doing with the industry. Um, because it's, it, as I said, your straightness and your ability to communicate and go very, very much to the core and to the heart of the matter, uh, and the, the the importance of of business, and you know, kind of demystifying it as not being this kind of 
uh, scary, horrible thing. And that's something that, that architects are, are, are very capable of being excellent at. Um, and so, yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. And if, and if people want to get in contact with you or to work with you, what's the best way for them to, to do that? It's archibiz, A-R-C-H-I-B-I-Z dot com dot A-U. And if they want to co- contact me, it's ray at archibiz dot com dot A-U. Fabulous. I shall put the, the details and the information. I know you're doing a 15-minute uh, call with people, but I do a 20-minute call. Oh, well, there you, oh, there you go. You've got the, the, the five minutes on me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Brilliant. But there's, Brilliant. There's, so much, there's so much opportunities out there and so much uh, help that's required. So I'm, I'm delighted to be speaking to you guys. No, and it, and it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a privilege and an honour to be able to sort of stand shoulder to shoulder with um, other consultants and to be, you know, learning from each other as well. And being able to help the the you know the architecture industry that we that we love and want to see prosper and have people people do exactly what it is they want to do in life couldn't agree more think snakes and ladders that's what i see fantastic ray thank you thanks ryan thanks a lot right. and that's a wrap if you enjoyed today's show please head on over to itunes and leave us a review i read every single one Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.